57-year-old Kevin Francis Ramey, who commonly goes by the name Birdman, was recently indicted by an Anchorage grand jury. The attorney prosecuting the case declined to interview, but did say that criminal non-support becomes a felony offense if it meets certain criteria, including if the amount is over $20,000 or no payment has been made for two years or more. In August, notice from Child Support Services indicating their intent to withhold his permanent fund dividend check alleges that Ramey owes more than $84,000 in back child support. After Ramey failed to appear for his first arraignment hearing this week, Judge Pat Douglas issued a bench warrant for his arrest. He was arrested by the VPSO in Togiak and flown to Dillingham. Asked by the judge if he understood his rights, one of Ramey's questions got a laugh in the courtroom. And it says if you're not a U.S. citizen, you could be deported. And I, I know I have three citizenships, number one in heaven, number two in America, number three in the California state. And uh, that's my primary citizenship is, is, of course, in heaven. So, you know, I was kind of wondering, is, are you guys going to deport me to heaven? <laughs> I hope not. He was ordered held on a $1,000 bail and will need a third-party custodian to be released. Ramey heads up a group known as Sui Juris Court Angels, the members of which adhere to tenets of sovereign citizenry. In a rambling five-page rebuttal to the case, Ramey attempts to claim the government's lack of authority to charge him with crimes. In Dillingham, I'm Dave Benninger. <laughs> I'm William Wagner here on our second such, and behind us is a scene from what? This is our fishing boats in Togiak, Alaska. This is where Birdman, otherwise baptized as what, Kevin? Kevin Francis Remy. Kevin Francis Remy, also known as Birdman, has a fishing boat. And I think it's this one down right here. Yeah, that one, you got it. Um, but that's not, you're not here to talk about fishing in Alaska, are you? No, no. What did we just watch on that screen? Well, uh, it, it, there's a little groundwork for actually what that was, but it started uh, back in, in uh, the early 90s. Uh, with uh, a group called Safe, Safe and Fear Free Environment, that would uh, canvass the local church and look for uh, men and their spouses that weren't getting along. Then they'd approach the spouses like they did mine one day, and and then offered her to uh, come let the kids look at some clothes. And then my problems began. Uh, who are these people? Safe and Fear Free Environment. Safe and fear-free environment. Huh. This sounds like one of those CPS-type organizations, child protective, family protection organizations designed by lesbians to destroy marriages. In Dillingham, Alaska, that's exactly correct. Well, you have lesbians up there? In uh, uh, yes. In Alaska? Or, or we just got rid of a DA that was stone-cold yeah. lesbian. So... What are we looking at? Is that the ocean or is that a bay? Oh, that's Togiak Bay out there. That's a beautiful bay. That, that's where I fish. And uh, we fish for five species of salmon out there. And the boat directly behind us is named Sean Peter. That's uh, my, uh, my significant other's uh, nephew's boat, which looks a lot different than it does in this photo. Uh, but uh, so does the boat that's uh, on my side here, right down there. That's yeah. Miss Bridget. It's the same type boat, only we're just seeing the bow of it. So um, Miss Bridget I had done over, and, and it, it uh, does value-added fishing. Now. So let me guess. You make a million dollars a month on your fishing boat. I wish, yes. <laughs> yeah. So you and uh, the mother of your two twin sons came to a parting of the ways because of this Safe and what were they called? Fear-free environment. Ah, safe and fear-free environment. That means the IRS never sends them letters, never knocks on their door. And, yeah. They all work together to <laughs> fling dad out of the house, and that's, that's what got yeah, me here. Yeah. It seems to be a common um, malady sweeping the United States, or I should say the disunited States of America, causing rampant divorce and, you know, I just saw a woman who uh, got divorced four times. And she was looking for her fifth husband when she croaked. Mm -hmm. At age 66, she croaked. And before she died, she mumbled something about, I should have stayed married to my first husband. <laughs> <laughs> 
So all of a sudden, the jerk that she left first suddenly was the only guy there when she died. Yeah. He, came, he came to be with her on her deathbed. So I look at these people, because I remember when I had some family problems, oh, 18, 20 some years ago, and somebody from the, a woman from the Santa Barbara District Attorney's Office was approaching my wife as she got home from work, and I just happened to be driving at the same time. And she was trying to take her aside and say, you ought to divorce him. And I drove up, and she saw me and did an about face, got back in her car and drove away. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what unmitigated gall? Since when did it become the business of the district attorney or anybody in government to go around saying, you ought to divorce him. Now, keep in mind, 40-some years my wife and I have been married. I have never hit her, punched her, kicked her, slapped her in all these years. How I have been hit, I have been slapped, mm -hmm. I have been shoved, but I have never hit back. And yet they were trying to tell her she's an abused woman, she should leave me, blah, 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 blah. And they do this all over. And then they don't have to pick up the pieces of the wreckage. Mm -hmm. When the kids end up turning gay, which is what I think they want to happen, and then they have a miserable life, catch AIDS, and the kids are dying from AIDS. And I've seen this in numerous families. But getting back to your case, so you started fighting in, in this thing, right? Uh, yes, right off the, the bat. Uh uh, first, this was what, 30 years ago, 20 years ago? Yeah, this is the early 90s, and then the first thing she told me was, uh, Safe's going to help me get a forced divorce, and of course I chuckled at her. I said, there's nothing such as a forced divorce. It takes two to get married and two to divorce. Then a month later, I got my very first complaint for divorce, and reading through it, I noticed right off the bat they were severing the bonds of matrimony. That was it. Holy matrimony. On our license, it's holy matrimony, but when it comes to the paperwork, it, they just sever the bonds of matrimony. If people don't see that the word holy has been removed, that's the definite definition of the matrimony. Uh, people don't see that that's been removed, then they just carry on and, and lick their wounds. And So you should raise an objection right there. Yes, I have. I've, I've never seen anybody else raise an objection on that, but it makes sense to me. I don't know in California if the certificate says holy matrimony. I, I, I've never really looked at a California marriage. Mine's out of Wisconsin. Usually they, they all seem to be uniform, and then they have the, the, the marriage license that you go in and do, which I'll show a copy of here pretty soon, but uh, then also the certificate of marriage, which says united in holy matrimony. Now, what did we just look like? Look at at the screen when we switched over to your segment of the show here. What what were we seeing there? Uh, to my segment of the show was uh, that was it took uh, 15 years of me just being uh, persistent uh, to to get them to come and put a pair of handcuffs on me so so uh, we could resolve this issue, the holy from matrimony. Uh, number one, that's the cornerstone of it all. See, if oh. uh, they claim that I owe child support, but of course my kids are, are grown now, and there's five of them all together. I have twins, that's the two. And uh, there's, we got Chris, Brendan, Braden, Bradley, and Kermit. And so... Are the twins the oldest? Uh, they're underneath the oldest. Oh, okay. And so... Uh, so, so you refuse to pay child support all this time? I, well, well, see, I've always not recognized their decree of divorce because it's fraudulent. So fraudulent, void, void ab initio. Yeah, void ab initio, correct. Yeah. And uh, so, therefore, any order after that would also be void ab initio of no, no force and effect of law. And so, basically, uh, uh, I've never recognize that and they've always tried to get me on some payment plan. Now if I get on that payment plan, that's implied consent to their nonsense Yeah. and then I lose. So I've always had to just maintain my ground, let them take my permanent fund dividends, which is uh, a revenue That all Alaskans get just get for... Once a year. So and they keep sucking all your money. Yeah, they, they take those, they don't put them down on the statements. I've never seen them on a statement. They've taken them over the past 20 years to the tune of probably between twenty and thirty thousand dollars, 
just for that. Do they come to your fishing boat and claim that they own your fish that you catch? Uh, well, right now they're tr they were trying to figure out how to how to crack the the fishing boat because the f fishing boat actually uh, is is uh, the permit is a, a daughter of my significant other. We fish the permit, and oh. the boat. Uh, my significant other bought the boat, so we'd have a nice little boat to fish in compared to uh, what was there before that. So okay. Yeah. So where is this Togiak, Alaska? Is that south of Juneau? Or? Well, it's 70 air miles south of Dillingham, which is 470 air miles west of, southwest of Anchorage, Alaska. We're right on the Bering Sea coast. Uh, oh! If you ever heard of, like, Round Island, where all the walrus refuge oh, is. Oh, okay. So that's so, where you are. Yes. All right. Do we want to hear that audio tape? Yeah, let's let's listen to that again. See that again. People, pay attention to this. I think it's interesting. David Roach in Indiana also claims that there's a law against paying child support out of I think it was Minnesota. The courts ruled that child support's unlawful. It is. Everything they're doing is unlawful. Yeah, most of what the government does yeah. unlawful. It's yeah. it's just a government of unlawfulness. They call us unlawful. Give us ten years. Yeah. They're unlawful. They get nothing. Well, they take their Except pensions. the farm. The yeah. farm, yeah. 57-year-old Kevin Francis Ramey, who commonly goes by the name Birdman, was recently indicted by an Anchorage grand jury. The attorney prosecuting the case declined to interview, but did say that criminal non-support becomes a felony offense if it meets certain criteria, including if the amount is over $20,000 or no payment has been made for two years or more. In August, notice from Child Support Services indicating their intent to withhold his permanent fund dividend check alleges that Ramey owes more than $84,000 in back child support. After Ramey failed to appear for his first arraignment hearing this week, Judge Pat Douglas issued a bench warrant for his arrest. He was arrested by the VPSO in Togiak and flown to Dillingham. Asked by the judge if he understood his rights, one of Ramey's questions got a laugh in the courtroom. And it says, if you're not a U.S. citizen, you could be deported. And I, I know I have three citizenships, number one in heaven, number two in America, number three in the California state. And uh, that's my primary citizenship is, is, of course, in heaven. So, you know, I was kind of wondering, is, are you guys going to deport me to heaven? <laughs> I hope not. He was ordered held on $1,000 bail and will need a third-party custodian to be released. Ramey heads up a group known as Sui Juris Court Angels, the members of which adhere to tenets of sovereign citizenry. In a rambling five-page rebuttal to the case, Ramey attempts to claim the government's lack of authority to charge him with crimes. In Dillingham, I'm Dave Benninger. If I had again, it's cold up there in Alaska. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> it's cold up there in Alaska, even on the coast in November. So we're now we're down here in Santa Maria, California, where it was 87 degrees today. Today, yep. I bet your friends up there envied you, huh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was hiding indoors where it was cool. <laughs> he was hiding indoors where it was cool. He's not used to 80-degree uh, temperatures in November. So, <clears throat> so this experience of fighting them, have you ever voluntarily paid any amount of child support? Uh, yes, I Paid what I could, when I could. Directly to them. And and there's another clincher that they... they but you, you didn't to the government, no, though, right? No, not You them. gave it, which they call a, a gift. gift. Yeah. And the reason is... Uh, because they want you to funnel your money through them. Through them, because then they get equal matching federal funds for the bureaucrats to pay themselves pensions, people. They don't care about the kids and the ex-wife. It's about the government critter criminals' pensions and their salaries and their vacation plans. It's not about helping the children. So I had the same thing. I gave money directly to two of my seven children's mother and sometimes directly to the kids. And they say, oh, that's a gift. That, that doesn't count. Yeah. Oh, really? It still helps feed them, but they don't want to count any of that. So when you buy them food, you buy them clothes, that doesn't count because they want it to go through the system so they can get that free federal 
fiat money out of Washington, D.C. And this is how they enslave us all, isn't it, yes. Birdman? They and enslave us all. The other, the other thing, you know, I think is support just money. What else is support into which? Yeah, there's emotional support. There's spiritual support. And I, you know, I've seen a lot of children that were cut off from their father. I actually went to visit several thousand of these children. Mm -hmm. They're locked up in a prison in Missouri. And I spoke, and I have on tape the man who was um, <clears throat> the third ranking guy. You have the, you know, you have the warden of the prison. Mm -hmm. Then you got the senior deputy warden. And this guy was the third guy. I have him on tape. They're out of the picture, and they're going to end up over there in that prison. Mm -hmm. That's all you got to do. Get the father out of the picture, and you're almost guaranteed you're going to have girls getting pregnant from guys because they're looking for that male connection that they should have had with their father. But since father's removed, they go to the next best thing, a boyfriend who will get them pregnant. And then it ain't the right boyfriend. Mm -hmm. But what they really needed was a stable, loving, working relationship with their own father. Cut that out. Girls get pregnant, get on drugs. I know several right here in Santa Barbara had their babies, lost their babies. They don't know who their dad is. Yeah. These are young women in their early 30s and one's, I think, 29. They don't know who their father is, and their mother's not sure who their father is. So that's, you know, this is the breakdown of America. So here you got Birdman. Yes. Who refuses to recognize their divorce because the holy matrimony takes it out of whose jurisdiction and puts it in whose, Birdman? It's, it's, a, a, it's a biblical jurisdiction with the holy there. So it takes us into the common law, the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments, common law, and they don't have the jurisdiction. They don't have, it's, it's a, marriage should be a, a, a commitment between one man, one woman, and God. Uh, no, no state of Alaska, state of California, or any other state. For or Texas time. or anywhere else. So if, if you're out there and you want to fight this fight, uh, but it cost him his dividend. See, he's from, he lives up in Alaska. Actually, you were born in California, weren't you? Yes, yes, Indio, California. He was born in California, but back in, what, the 70s or 80s, you decided Alaska was a better place? Well, it was, uh, yeah, I was waiting tables in, in the first part of the 80s in Palm Springs at a French restaurant called Gaston's mm -hmm. and decided to go over, you know, after five years of being there, over a little incident there. And uh, a, a lady that I told her I was leaving, she uh, pointed me in the direction of Alaska. And that was 86. I went up there, and I've been up there ever since. Do you like Alaska? Oh, I love it. It's beautiful. God's country. Are there places where you can go where you won't see any police, any bureaucrats, any tax collectors? Uh, yeah, if you go farther back into the bush from where I'm at in the village. There. Are there a lot of sort of, uh, we might call them rugged individualists that like to go back in the bush just to get away from? I've seen plenty of them, yeah. And they just stay back there and, and live off the land, huh? Yeah, yeah. Just walk back there with their belongings and a bow and arrow, something to... And just live something. back there. Yeah. Through the frigid cold weather and everything. Yeah. So the holy in the holy matrimony is why... The state of Alaska does not have the jurisdiction. Well, I, I asked him a question <clears throat> when I saw that. And it, it, it Which was? was with, uh, if the state forever severs the bonds of matrimony, will that also put us under holy matrimony? Did they answer you? They absolutely refuse. They don't want to go there. Simply because they know what they did is a fraud. And they don't want to admit to their own mistakes. They they want us to say we make mistakes, but they don't want to admit to their own mistakes. So you're on an ongoing battle with them. Yes. Started with them forcing, trying to force a divorce on you. Yes. But you said you've got a significant other in your life now, 15 years. Yes, yes. You don't talk to your holy matrimony wife, so that makes you a polygamist then, doesn't it? Uh, yes. In my mind, it most certainly does. Even I, though you don't talk to her and you don't get along with your holy yeah. matrimonial wife? It's, it's still forced, compelled polygamy. Yeah, compelled polygamy. Thank you, State of Alaska. Yes. 
Now we had, um, I don't want to let too much time go by. We had uh, a guy named what, Gary? David Gary Ga Gladden. Gladden. Now he's in what city? And we're going to pull him up on Skype. He's in Dillingham, Alaska, which is 70 air miles to the east of us. I just want to insert this if we can, people, if we can get uh, him on because he's got an interesting situation that um, Birdman just made me aware of, that he owned property in this, what, Billingsham? Dillingham. Dillingham, area of Alaska, free and clear, paid off. And keep in mind, they don't need a lot of taxes in Alaska because they make so much oil revenue that goes into a trust. And I remember Dick Randolph telling me about this way back in 1982 or something, long before I started doing a television show. Everybody in Alaska gets a dividend check from the oil profits, and they put it in a pool and give the citizens all of it every year or just a little tiny... Just a little fraction of amount. And uh, so they got what four hundred billion dollars in that Alaskan trust fund. Yeah. Then the other thing, and like in my case, there's like uh, probably twenty-seven, twenty-eight thousand uh, non-custodial parents that they get, and every year take those dividends. And oh. so you you can imagine that's quite a revenue stream just there alone. <laughs> Again, I don't know if you just caught the earlier part of my show with Senior Bravo yes. and Esperanza Bravo, but it seems like just unbridled greed. Everybody that's part of the bar carted mafia. And let me say it again in case you missed my other show. There is not a single attorney, member of the Bar Association, that has a license issued by somebody who gets paid by the state of Alaska, California, Texas, or any state. It's just a private club. It's an incorporated private club. Anyway, he's there. he's there. Can you hear us, uh, David? Yes, I can. Gr greetings from Dillingham, Alaska. Bourbon. There's David. Hi, David. Hi, David. Hi there. How you doing, William? I think this is the first time we've done a long-range interview to Alaska. I think this is a first, David, of 15 years of doing this TV show. Right on. So did I say it right? You had property, it was paid for free and clear, and then they said you owe some kind of tax and they're gonna foreclose? The, the town is gonna to foreclose on your property? Yes, uh, actually I purchased this uh, property. It was part of a uh, United States land patent in 1978, but I did not realize the significance of that at the time until I got it paid off in 2000. And then I got around and did a recorded private land claim along with the United States land patent number and got it all recorded, dropped off the radar as far as contributing their uh, property taxes that they have out here. And it's just like you've been talking about earlier. We have unbridled greed amongst these government, uh, so-called corporate government officers and they want your stuff called civil asset forfeiture. So along about uh, 2009, 2010, they started foreclosure proceedings. And of course, uh, I understand that uh, United States patented land cannot be taxed or taken for debt. But they proceeded forward in their bogus court, which had no jurisdiction. It was just a state court. This is a federal matter, so it should have been in, in the United States District Court in Anchorage, would have been the court of proper jurisdiction. So they went ahead and got a judgment in the state court, and then uh, on February 5, 2011, uh, three, actually four armed uh, Dillingham City Police Department officers and one uh, Alaska State Trooper came on my uh, land and through locked doors, forced entry through locked doors, and forced me off my property at gunpoint. And, and then they put up a sign that said that uh, 
they had found the property abandoned and that it was unsafe, which was untrue. And so I, I got around and filed a uh, lawsuit in September against the city of Dillingham and the officers in uh, the uh, Superior Court here locally in Dillingham. And that worked its way up through the Supreme Court, Alaska Supreme Court, and got a, an opinion. They don't give judgments, it's just a memorandum of opinion. And they totally sidestepped me on all the issues of my clear title. I had a fee simple absolute. And I sent you some documents on your email there. I don't know if you can put them up for the people to see or not, but you'll see the United States land patent and my recorded private land claim. And then they got around and, and did a public auction on September 17, day after I had had a uh, telephonic uh, court induction hearing trying to get the the uh, auction stopped. Of course, they ruled against me on that, even though I had a recorded Liz Pendens in place that was supposedly froze the assets uh, until the lawsuit had been adjudicated. Anyway, they went ahead and had a public auction. Uh, Jerry Ball of Ecock Properties LLC was the only bidder. And the following Monday, the 18th or 19th, he, he received a uh, uh, quick claim deed, all interest, if any. David, can I interrupt you a minute? <clears throat> uh, we're only seeing half your face. Do you have a light on the left side you can turn on? Drop. You don't get no. a lot of solar energy up there, do you? Right. This is the dark time of year for us, so we're getting uh, getting uh, the shortest day is uh, sun up about gets light about eleven and uh, dark at five. So we're down to about five, six hours of a possible sunlight. What, what month was it when they forced you off your property that you owned fee absolute in? What month was that? Uh, it was February five, two thousand eleven. Yep. That was became it in the a, dark the Gladden that homestead. Did? did this happen in the dark? Uh, no, it was about 11 o'clock in the morning. The, the sun was up then. So we're, we're getting longer daylight by February, but it's still cold. It's the middle of Alaska winter. So you, you definitely don't want to be uh, thrown out of your, your nice warm house in the middle of Alaska winter. Wow. But uh, that's so what happened. So we became a crime scene on February 5, 2011. But the crime Still was committed crime by scene. the police then. Right. The police criminal trespass on my private land patent and uh, through locked doors and, uh, and forced me off at gunpoint. Amazing. So what are you going to do yep. about it? It's gone to the... Alaska Supreme Court, are you going to take it to the federal courts? Right. Yeah, I've exhausted. Uh, uh, I've, I've had about six different uh, lawsuits. I've worked through the courts in the last 10 years, uh, going up to the Alaska Supreme Court. Uh, they finally got around on this uh, next to the last lawsuit and had the undersigned jurist, Vanessa White, from the Palmer Courthouse issue a gag order preventing me from uh, filing lawsuit against this corrupt little municipal corporation out here known as the city of Dillingham. They have no tax ordinance. Uh, they were repealed all their tax ordinances in uh, June of 1977. Uh, I have a uh, affidavit from the sitting clerk that says they cannot find the documentation for Exhibit A that's supposed to be attached to this repeal that uh, tells what, what they were intending to have happen. Uh, they, they did not have a tax referendum. They should have immediately put a vote 
to the people, had them decide what they wanted to do, whether they want to be a first-class city or something else, so that they could continue levying tax. So we've essentially been running on about 38 years of fraud against the people. Uh, no uh, ordinance, no tax ordinance. Uh, not unlawful to tax a land patent. They have a whole class of citizens out here known as Alaska Natives who live tax-free on their native allotments. The city of Dillingham collects uh, almost a half million dollars payment in lieu of tax funds. That's a federal subsidy every year that uh, covers the uh, non-taxed native holdings. So that was my in suggestion was to include me. I'm a on a land patent, United American citizen on a United States land patent. Just include me on your federal subsidy there, and we're all good to go. But they said, no, you're a white boy. you got to pay. So they've got a double standard going on in, here uh, because I'm the wrong color. Uh, just like you get to pay, or so they think. So, so this is... <clears throat> this. So my question to uh, David Gary Gladden is... Don't you have a Bundy Ranch type militia and a common law grand jury up there that you could put together and take them to task like they did at the Bundy Ranch last April of 2014 where the militia showed up and pointed big guns right back at the BLM? The Birdman and I are working on that problem. It's kind of slow going because uh, the uh, mindset out here is one of entitlements. And uh, because we get the permanent fund dividend every year, all the native folks get a dividend check either once a year or four times a year, quarterly. It's, it's very w uh, well received because we don't have much of a local economy. It's very seasonal in nature with just the, the fishing in the summertime. And so it, it really reverts to a subsistence style life lifestyle the rest of the time. Folks are pretty much not tuned in to militia just yet, but we're trying to get them tuned up through the Sioux Juris Court Angels to uh, get them thinking along those lines because it's all set up and in place that people just to wake up and need to start using. The, our grand jury is a wonderful tool. We just... Uh, wake up, you know, and get people tuned up and, and using it, why we would do that. At the moment, no, it's not anything that that we're really using just yet. Wow. I would think that those several thousands of um, white dudes that disappear in the bush just to avoid all the complications would come out of the bush to help you because they can always filter back into those public lands and disappear again. I mean, I had a friend, two friends from Vietnam. One went up into a California wilderness park and just lived the rest of his life there. Never paid taxes, never got involved with anything after the Vietnam. He just disappeared, and one went up to Alaska. And I never heard from him, I think, after 1978. He just disappeared in the bush and lived there and and didn't vote, didn't pay taxes, just ignored the rest of the country. And I think I got one postcard from him in 1990. He was still alive. And he said, you ought to come up here, Bill. Uh, we do fishing. We eat fish right out of the stream. <laughs> Occasionally, we take down a, a critter that gets old and wounded, and we have fresh, fresh uh, venison. Uh, we don't pay taxes. And... I just couldn't see myself trudging through four feet of fresh snow every day and wearing, you know, snowshoes uh, to get to my meal. It just, I came from Wisconsin. I had enough cold. But this, David, do you think you'll get justice? Or is uh, this I'm just hoping. about disenfranchising the people that stole this country from the Native Americans? I'm hoping to get justice in the federal courts. The, the other aspect of of this whole thing, in addition to the land ownership, 
as your citizenship. And so we access our fundamental rights through the, the uh, individual state constitutions. And so I've recorded my, my status as a citizen of Alaska. And that's how I intend to proceed and to the federal court, test Mr. Ball's uh, ownership here. All interest, if any, what happened to the perfected title that I had and the transaction going to him, he gets all interest, if any. Seems like uh, we're missing something here. He's, this is four, over four years into this, and he still can't get title insurance. Amazing. So he, it Amazing. Is. David, we're going to have to get back to you because I've got Birdman here live in the studio down here in sunny, warm, hot, heated California, 80-some <laughs> degrees here today. We were sweating. He was drinking water constantly, you know. He's <laughs> looking for a refrigerated room he could crawl into. But thank you for tuning in all the way from Alaska. We'll get you back on the show in another day, David, all right? All right, William. Look forward to it. Thanks for having me on. You're Have welcome. Have a good evening. Okay. We're back here from that. That was live, people, as you're watching this Friday night, the 20th of November. That was live from Alaska with David Gary Gladden fighting to keep his U.S. patent fee and simple. Fee simple means you owe nobody nothing. You own the property free and clear of all liens, taxes, everything. Nobody can touch with your property. That's what fee simple means. And it's rare to find a piece of property anywhere. Okay, now I'm looking at a hand-done document. It says notary complaint. Explain. Well, this has uh, charged me with criminal non-support and fishing without a license. I, I launched a document, Adam, and uh, which is... A lot of documents. Yeah. Well... This is to Governor Bill Walker. Yeah. See, what they did was filed a document, and then because they wanted to put the pressure on me because I put so much pressure on them, uh, they charged my significant other, Mary, with uh, uh, criminal negligence uh, for hi hiring me as an employee on the fishing boat, which isn't accurate. I'm a, that makes them makes her criminally negligent? Uh, that's, that's it. But that's really stretching. Now, here's the, the thing, and if you, uh, if you went in through, like, this, this document here, this is... This is the document, and he's explaining in here that, uh, number one, if anybody should be negligent, should be a vi uh, Department of Fish and Game because they come on the boat every year. It's in this section here. Uh -huh. uh, they come on the boat and they check our licenses and our ID, make sure we got both because if we don't, we're, we're going to get ticketed. And see, she knows that's a, a requirement to, to have those. Like up, now, up you on see the, this form up here? Yeah, up on the screen, there's my license. Uh, I got it okay, but if you look at that fine print, you know, that's what they uh, yeah. peel down so nobody can quite read that, and then they get you under their, their little uh, thing. But they said that, you know, if you uh, have any outstanding child support, but there again, I've never recognized, and they've never proved up that they So you declined to be, to jump into their... The yeah. corporate bandwagon of uh, Alaska citizens. Yeah, and that's what they do. They they want to pull you in. And, and that frustrated them. If you get out, they try and pull you right back in. So the next year, they issued you a little thing, and the print was even smaller in fewer words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They took <laughs> they took all the damaging stuff out. Oh, because you took them to task. Yeah. That's amazing. That, one man. That was over one uh, statement on there. It says uh, they have a little box, and it says, no, I'm not a... A, a United States citizen. So, <laughs> so you're denying them jurisdiction. Yes, I finished this We're because down to almost the, the five minutes here. The complaint is is they we both put in pro se documents and what they did was uh, they wanted to get Mary on a an attorney or a public pretender so they yeah they, they she could be re represented and they sent her documents back without even filing them into the record. And basically, they wanted uh, the next day after they sent them, they put in a motion to join the cases. And, that's and this. If, if if they if they join the cases, that knocks this notary out because then I'm a party to the case, right? So right now I'm her notary, which is like the secretary <laughs> of the state going. 
And so I'm, I'm yeah, I'm putting you, the, this. You're getting, they're giving them a big wedgie. You're giving them a big wedgie in their government butt. Yes. Is what you're doing. And I, I suspect they don't like you. Yeah, yeah, they're trying to figure out how to. And you had a brother up there, and what happened to him? Uh, well, he disappeared, and I'm not really sure what happened. They said, you he know, drowned. Uh, he drowned. Fell through a hole in a frozen lake. Well, well there was a canoe that they were in, and it went yeah. over. And uh, uh, him and a, a friend passed on, but uh, the other guy that was part of the the, the crew there that uh, he sim seemed to survive. So I'm I'm not really sh sure, you know, what, what happened there, or uh, I could never get anything, you know, investigated. The state. Isn't that funny? When you want the government to investigate or take a police report, somehow they just don't think it's necessary. Yeah. And you got to ask yourself, are we really having a government by we the people? Or are they asserting themselves over us and becoming our dictators? Pushing us down into serf and slave status. Because I look at all these documents, and I like the way you hand wrote most of this complaint, handwritten. And they have to, by law, accept it, people. I, I know sometimes you go and the clerk will say, well, that's not the right form. you got to do this and that. No, if you've got the essential correct information, even handwritten, the clerk must. And the U.S. SCOTUS, that's the U.S. Supreme Court, the United States Supreme Court, has ruled they have to take it. Now we get to the Michael Jackson stuff because all of this has got you to want to create something called Court Angels? Yeah, it's, I found it in 2005. I knew I wasn't getting any, anywhere uh, with them all on me and I knew I needed an organization above me. So I created uh, Sui Juris Court Angels Foundation and with that foundation I'm working to provide absolutely free total court services to the layman at law, whether rich or poor, uh, absolutely free. We don't ask what's in your wallet, and therefore... And you, how, how are you hoping to fund this? That's equal protection. Yeah, equal protection, which we don't have right yeah. now. In fact, by the way, i got to tell you, a new thing happened uh, with Ronald Carrari. You can insert this, and we'll be right back. Okay. Just today, the public defender called him, who was appointed only for the last hearing, which was just a few days ago, because he fired the guy who was deliberately losing his case, a, a guy named Dunkel, who worked for S Robert Sanger, Swinson, and Dunkel. And he finally stood up and fired him right before sentencing, all right? Now they got to give him till December 30, 21st to find a new one. But he's got to report November 30th just to tell the judge who his new attorney is. Well, that's only about two weeks to get a new attorney. Well, good attorneys like Murphy or Elon Funky Baloo, you don't just pick them up in two weeks. They already got other clients lined up, and it may take a while. So just today, what happens is he gets a call from the public defender and says, hey, I'm putting it on schedule for this coming Monday, a week before November 30th, but you don't have to be there. Well, that's an open invitation to have the judge arrest him for not appearing in court. I'm going to be there Monday morning on the 23rd of November in Judge Flores' courtroom. And if nobody else knows, I heard it with my ears and it's on the master audio tape, he was only his public defender for that day, for that specific hearing. So this whole thing doesn't have to happen. But it looks to me like the public defenders trying to set up Mr. Karari to go in handcuffs for not showing up for a hearing that his own public defender is telling me you don't have to show up for. Then he won't be able to find a good defense attorney. Because in my mind, both the second trial and the first trial should be obliterated because his own attorney did not bring up the one key thing. The police came at him with guns drawn. He was home peacefully working on his property, on his car. They had no search warrant at that point. That makes the Sheriff's Department of Santa Barbara thugs because they're aiming and brandishing weapons at a man who's peacefully working on his own property. Later, after they create a standoff, they print Judge McGregor, who I just saw today in another trial, they print his name on a warrant. 
If we start letting the cops write the judge's name in on a warrant, we're in serious trouble in America, people. I have a big issue with that. And I can't wait to get Judge McGregor here on the show to explain why that's okay. Because I don't think it's okay. I think that one extra step where you have to, cops have to go to a judge, explain why this guy is so dangerous. We've got to shut down Highway 101 for two hours, point a 30 caliber machine gun at his back door, which if they had fired it, would have put bullets flying right through the 101, putting the public at risk. And then right after they tear gas his house and put him in jail, I'm talking about Ronald Carrari, not Mr. Birdman here. Uh, after they do that, a witness says he sees one of the sisters that needed the restraining order driving on his property. And shortly after that, the documents for the family Carrari trust disappear out of his house. The cops left his house open so anybody could have walked in, stole his flat screen TV or anything. But the only thing was missing was the big envelope with the family trust documents. Hello? This is beginning to look like one of his sisters committed felony trespass while claiming she needed to be protected from her own brother. This story has not been heard in court. The second jury didn't hear it all. The first jury only heard a part of it. And they acquitted him on many charges. But if the warrant issue had been put forward, all this evidence would have been thrown out because it's all tainted. They had no warrant when they started this thing. And Dunkel failed to raise it, even though Mr. Karari was begging him to. Okay, enough of that because we're going to run out of time. I just thought I'd throw that in mm -hmm. so because I won't get another show in before this will be seen. So... Getting out of the Michael Jackson art. So you, you want to create court angels. Yes. And you think you're going to be able to make a deal that'll bring in a couple hundred million dollars, some deal with... Explain this, how Michael Jackson's art that has not been seen largely by the world, how is this going to generate money for court angels? Well, it's got to not only generate money for court angels, but Mike, Michael's original plan was to be able to, to create a revenue stream to, you know, off the art, you know, various uh, projects with it to, to feed hungry children around the world. So, but at the same time, uh, there's, should be plenty to go around and uh, interweave it in with court angels and then some of the proceeds can then go in to pay for attorneys or uh, now, this was always set up in a partnership deal with Mr. Strong, correct? Yes, yes. So the estate attorneys cannot get their sticky fingers on this, can That's they? That's exactly right. Woo! Go, Jackson team! He, 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 was, he was thinking when he... He was thinking. thinking. Put that together, yes. Michael was thinking. And I bet you if they put a book of Michael's art out there, it would fly <coughs> off the shelves at $100 a crack. Yes, I think so. And he's he's actually got one ready to go, so Michael Jackson yeah. got a book. As a matter of fact, if you're uh, looking at the screen yeah. now, this was uh, young artistic Michael, because uh, yeah. he was he was actually artistic. Uh, you're getting uh, a, a, a once a in a t lifetime people preview of what has not been made public. This you're not going to see this on NBC or Fox News or mm -hmm. CNN. Yeah, he was really talented, and, and not only in just singing and and uh, giving. He was really artistic. He was a, a, a genius and a saint. We had a genius saint. Here's another photo. What are we seeing there? That's uh, Michael when he's just kind of <coughs> leisure and I believe he's, you know, reading some lyrics there. Yeah. What's the next picture of? Do you know? Uh, off the top of my head until I see it. Oh, you, you got to stand right next to his Maserati, right? Yes, yes. Uh, he ordered a Maserati and by the time it came, uh, he was... He uh, was gone. Lamborghini. Oh, I'm sorry, Lamborghini. Yeah, and then yeah, uh, it they was. They go for what a quarter million or something? Uh, Three hundred thousand. Three hundred thousand. What he paid for it? Well, it's artwork too. Here. Yeah, here it shows him a uh, painting. Or I mean, sketching Peter Pan. Wow. And so that's what. There's a lot of pictures of him. You know, when he's just doodling along. Wow. Uh, sketching these things. So, that was uh, a good one called the dance. Uh, which is his uh, signature, you know, where he comes up on his toes. Yeah. And I, I really like that. 
that picture. Uh, we'll see what one comes up here, though. Uh, this is uh, Sir Brent Livingstone Strong and Michael right there in there. Yeah, in the lower left corner, and, I see him. Uh, see, back in the bicentennial uh, era, Warren Berger commissioned him to, to sketch the presidents. So there's a number of them that he's sketching, and that one that's right down there is, I believe, the uh, Declaration of Independence that we were looking at. Amazing. And, and, and the world doesn't know Michael's done all this. Yeah. This is like brand new information. Yeah. Do you think Mr. Strong was sitting quietly on this stuff because yeah. of the sticky fingers of the estate attorneys? Uh, yeah, well, they were probably trying to figure out how to come at him. See, there's that one again. Beautiful and, work done by Michael Jackson. Yeah. You know, he had a lawsuit against one of his maids here, and uh, she had stolen some of his artwork and a jacket, and he won that lawsuit. She sued him for wrongful termination. He sued her. He, he came out the winner, and people don't know about that lawsuit. Yeah. So as we go out, I want to thank you people for being with the Birdman from Alaska here. And I hope he's successful in getting court angels up and running. And thank you, Birdman. Thank and you. Thank you, David Gary Gladden, for Skyping in from Alaska.